Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to be with you again. I hope if you had a sports team playing, whether it was football or baseball, that they won today. Or in Texas, right? Football is supposed to be a big thing here, right? So, uh, actually, I had the uh, um, joy today of uh, uh, Pastor uh, Caldwell took me to uh, see an Astros Rangers game today, and that was a that was a real delight. He really does show his godliness. He was, you know, rooting for the Rangers, obviously, and they they lost today. But he he handles it well and shows his sanctification well, even in the midst of a loss. I was very, very impressed. I think he does better than when my team's losing. So anyway. So anyway, but again, it's, it's great to be with you uh, as we're doing this uh, conference on Israel and the church. This is part two. Uh, hopefully you were able to be with us uh, last night. If you weren't, I think, it, I think these are being recorded. So uh, what we covered last night in this uh, series, really a five-part series on Israel and the church, more specifically, has the church replaced Israel? Uh, I let off yesterday by uh, offering a, a positive presentation of the Bible's storyline in regard to, to Israel and uh, laid out some stuff concerning you know, Israel's you know, past, present, and future, uh, talked about some verses and passages that I think uh, uh, strongly indicate that even though you know, Israel has experienced God's judgment for disobedience, for rejecting the Messiah, that there's still a future uh, for the nation Israel, so we covered that yesterday. Uh, and really, in a nutshell, I think the best, uh, the best uh, antidote or remedy for replacement theology, uh, which I'll again define here shortly, um, but the view that the church has replaced Israel, is mostly a positive presentation of the Bible storyline and how that includes Israel. And of course, as we're talking about Israel and what God is doing for them, it's, it's centered on the ultimate Israelite, Jesus the Messiah, who is the one who brings you know, everything to comp- completion and fulfillment. You know, in Matthew 5, he promises that every jot and tittle of what the Scripture says is going to come true. And that also includes Israel as well. But that, of course, is centered in him. Uh, what I wanted to do now was um, I, I wanted to discuss some things in regard to replacement theology. So I was actually looking at my uh, lesson for tomorrow where I was in the morning, uh, uh, not, not the actual sermon, but in the morning, I was looking at the material that I had as far as discussing issues related to replacement theology, and I actually wanted to touch on some of those areas tonight because I felt like tomorrow might be a little bit crammed, so I'm going to uh, int- introduce some of these issues now, obviously since this is a you know, conference on replacement theology, to give you a good explanation and definition of that I think is important. And of course, as we move throughout the conference, we're going to uh, also talk about how Jesus the Messiah is at the center of this program, how the church fits into all this. So I just wanted to make some, uh, some statements here about uh, replacement theology. Uh, from my understanding and looking at this issue for, uh, for several years, uh, I think a, a proper definition of replacement theology, let me see how that looks for you guys. Okay, that looks good there. Replacement theology is the view that the church replaces, supersedes, or fulfills Israel in such a way that two things Uh, The church is viewed as the new or true Israel, and the nation Israel no longer has a role to play to the nations in God's purposes. So notice I use the the terms here, replaces, supersedes, or fulfills. Not everybody uses the same language, and sometimes people get hung up on the title or one particular word, and and although I think there are certain words that are more apt than others, uh, the main issue here is we're dealing with with the concept, this concept that somehow... Um, Israel's role in the Old Testament was more you know, shadowy, or to use a fancier term, uh, a type, or you know, that pointed forward to something that is much greater. And once the church comes along, then God's purposes for Israel as a nation and them having a role in the future um, go away. Let me give you uh, some theologians who have offered definitions of replacement theology. So I have, I have a list here of statements. Uh, Walter Kaiser, who's you know, one of the most... Uh, respected you know, evangelical theologians. Uh, he gives a definition of replacement theology where he says, Rep- replacement theology declared that the church, Abraham's spiritual seed, uh, had replaced national Israel and that it had transcended and fulfilled the terms of the covenant given to Israel, which covenant Israel had lost because of disobedience. Another individual who's looked in this issue, the uh, Italian theologian Ronald DePros, 
defines replacement theology as the view that, quote, the church completely and permanently replaced ethnic Israel in the working out of God's plan and as recipient of Old Testament promises to Israel. Now what I have here is actually some statements from those who would espouse what could be called a replacement view or a you know, supersessionist view. And by the word supersessionism, that would you know, indicate that somehow the church has superseded Israel in God's plans. Th those first two definitions that I gave you were actually from people who were not replacement theologians but have studied this issue and felt that that was an appropriate title. Uh, now I just want to give you a series of quotes from people who would hold to what we would consider to be replacement theology and actually use that sort of language. Uh, Bruce Waltke declared that the New Testament teaches the, quote, hard fact that national Israel and its law have been permanently replaced by the church and the new covenant. So what's significant there is a, you know, a contemporary you know, evangelical theologian has, you know, actually uses the word replaced here. He talks about national Israel has been permanently replaced by the church and the new covenant. According to Hans K. La Rondel, a scholar who's you know, written on a lot on the issue of uh, the church in Israel and Bible interpretation principles, he says the New Testament affirms that, quote, Israel would no longer be the people of God and would be replaced by a people that would accept the Messiah and his message of the kingdom of God. So again, here you have another theologian who is uh, comfortable with using the term replace. And again, one of the reasons why I may be emphasizing this so much is because in the last few years, uh, it, it's, it's been common for some to deny that replacement theology has ever existed. They'll say, well, we're not talking about replacement, we're talking about continuation, we're talking about fulfillment. And one of the things I'm just trying to establish here is that this terminology of replacement has a long standing all throughout uh, the church history. So it's important to understand that, that when people use, if they happen to use the term replacement theology, they're not inventing it out of thin air. It's based on uh, a lot of evidence and documentation you know, from those who have actually used, used that term. Uh, La Rondell goes on to say that he believes that this people is the church who replaces the Christ rejecting nation. An individual named Lorraine Bettner, a scholar, uh, wrote this. He says, It may seem harsh to say that God is done with the Jews, but the fact of the matter is that he is through with them as a unified national group, having anything more to do with the evangelization of the world. That mission has been taken from them and given to the Christian church. So even though he doesn't use the word replace, he does say you know, that it has been taken from them and given to the Christian church. So again, uh, language that would be consistent with replacement. Um, another very well-respected scholar, Hermann Ritterboss, said the church springs from, is born out of Israel. On the other hand, the church takes the place of Israel as the historical people of God. So in this sense, he kind of, I guess in a sense, uh, mixes the, uh, the, uh, the concepts of continuation or the church springing from Israel, but he also says, on the other hand, the church takes the place of Israel as the historical people of God. R.T. France, another well-respected uh, scholar and uh, commentator, said, there is to be a new people of God in place of Old Testament Israel. So as we go through these, we see a lot of this. Now, uh, next, I actually refer uh, to someone uh, who... And I actually find this quite significant because I actually give you the picture of the book here. I don't think you can see the title of this book, but this book came out just recently, just last February in 2015. It's called Perspectives on Israel and the Church, and, and it's a four views book. If you're familiar with the views book, I, you know, that what will happen is there's a theological topic that's oftentimes hotly debated, and then you'll have three or four different scholars you know, debate that view back and forth. And so, in, in this book, Perspectives on Israel and the Church, uh, the person who is representing the position that would be referred to as covenant theology, um, Robert Raymond, uh, in this book twice, I guess I don't mention it here, that he, he, talk, he, mentions, he does more than once, he mentions this twice, he refers to, quote, our Lord's replacement theology. So what's significant about that is not only is he using the term replace, but he's actually owning 
the, 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 the designation replacement theology. So I found that significant, particularly, um, like I said, since in the last five, year, six year, ten year, you know, last ten years or so, there's been kind of a uh, resistance to uh, the, the, the word replace uh, being used. And this is um, a scholar writing specifically on this issue of the Israel and the church in a debate book and proudly owns the title twice, uses our Lord's replacement theology. As I mentioned, this view is sometimes called supersessionism or fulfillment theology. Some today do not like the title replacement theology. They want another term such as continuation or fulfillment. But a couple of responses to that would be there is and by the way, I don't, I don't feel like we should have to push a title on somebody who doesn't want it. So if somebody says, I don't like that term replacement theology, I'm not going to say, no, you must own it. We're not going to talk anymore until you own that title. I don't think that does any good. Like I said, I think the issue that's more in play here is the concept. It's the, it's the view that somehow, because of what's taken place with Jesus in the church age, that the church somehow becomes Israel, and there's no more significance or purpose for national Israel and God's plan. Um, but I guess I would just say to those who would um, not like that particular terminology is that, number one, there is a long history in the church of theologians saying the church has replaced Israel. And we actually have some actually owning the title replacement theology. So, um, so that title replacement theology, again, it's not just something concocted out of thin air. It's something that I think has been rooted and documented in a lot of statements uh, throughout history. And thus, too, the main issue is the idea behind this theology and not specifically uh, the exact title that we give it. And I would also say, too, as one who's you know, wrestled with this issue and has you know, interacted with a lot of people you know, one-on-one or you know, in their articles or in their books, uh, for those that are re- resistant to the idea of replacement theology but want to use the term fulfillment theology or continuation, I really don't find a lot of difference in the arguments that they're making. Again, that doesn't mean that I won't find someone who does. Uh, But as as I look at this particular issue, it's not like I study the arguments of those who affirm replacement theology and then look at the arguments of those who like another title. And then it's not that I see a lot of difference uh, between the argumentation. Usually what it ends up coming down to with both replacement (laughs) theology or a Fulfillment theology is the belief that because Jesus is true Israel, and by the way, I affirm that. I'm going to talk about that today. We can rightly say Jesus is true Israel. I think that the issue is going to come is what's the significance of that? What are the implications of that? There's two different trajectories you can go with that. But, you know, but both camps will argue, by both camps, or I should say those who affirm a replacement terminology or those who have a, um, call it more of a fulfillment or a continuationism, they'll say because Jesus is Israel, Everybody who's in Jesus, whether they're Jew or Gentile, becomes Israel. And as a result, there's no future role for national Israel. Now, some of them may believe that there is a lot of Jews who will be saved in the end. I want to be clear on that. Not not everybody who holds to a replacement or fulfillment view denies that there's a salvation of ethnic Jews talked about in Romans chapter 11. But when it comes to Israel having the sort of role of leadership and function in a coming kingdom with the Messiah ruling from Jerusalem, from the capital city there, with a leadership functional role to the nations, that's usually where they draw the line. So uh, you'll get some who will say, actually, but there's going to be a lot of Jews saved, but I don't believe there's any significance uh, to the nation Israel. And in doing so, you know, they would view the church of the sage to be the complete fulfillment of the people of God, Um, the fulfillment of God's kingdom and covenant purposes, and then for for many of them, then we would roll into what's called the eternal state. Uh, Those who believe in a future significance for Israel usually affirm that there's a lot of great things going on in this age. There's a lot of things that that are being fulfilled, but there still needs to be a reign of the Messiah on the earth over the nations. Jesus, the Messiah, must rule the nations with a rod of iron, and he is going to have a capital city, Jerusalem, and as we saw in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 to 4, there will be theological uh, significance for Israel as a nation uh, during that uh, period. Uh, as you have Christ ruling nations, there's a particular nation uh, who, who is uh, functioning as the capital at that particular time. Now, when it comes to the issue of categories of replacement theology, 
Um, it, it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all. As a matter of fact, there's, although it ends up coming to the same conclusion, church is Israel, there's no uh, theological significance for national Israel. Um, there, there's, two, there's two main ways. Or when, I, or when I look at church history, I think there's two ways that replacement theology has been understood. The first one, what is called a punitive approach. And by the way, these titles here, um, punitive and economic, um, I'm, I'm borrowing from a, a scholar um, called uh, R. Kendall Solon, uh, as, as he did his study on replacement theology and supersessionism. He, he used these terms, and I've, I've, I found these to be pretty accurate. Um, the first one is called punitive and this is the belief that God is forever done with Israel because Israel acted wickedly. So in other words, Israel acted wickedly. Not only did they act wickedly in the Old Testament, but when they rejected Christ, there's not only a punishment and a setting aside of Israel, but it's a permanent setting aside. And I think that's, what, that's key there. Because I would affirm, and, and those who believe in a restoration of Israel, that they, they affirm Luke 19, 41 to 44. They affirm Luke 21, 20 to 24, which indicates that there are serious consequences and judgment for Israel rejecting the Messiah. I mean, Paul talks about it in Romans 11 as a, as a partial hardening. So no one's denying that there is a, a serious uh, judgment and punishment from God on Israel and because of what they've done. But if you hold to a punitive replacement theology, that means God is forever done with them. He's, he's, he's angry at them to such an extent that he, he puts them aside and he moves on with the church who replaces Israel. Uh, in, the his, in the roughly 2,000 years of church history, punitive replacement theology has been by far the predominant view. Uh, today, you know, with, you know in, in modern contemporary evangelical theology, there's a lot of nuance. I'm not saying that's always bad, but there's a lot of nuance in how we say things. They were a lot more blunt in the uh, earlier days. <laughs> they would just come out and say, God is forever done with Israel. Not everybody, some would say that. Uh, when, and, and when you get to the later Martin Luther, he actually made some of the strongest statements of what we would call a punitive replacement theology. Uh, Luther was very favorable towards the salvation of the Jews early in his life, but later on he was very vitriolic towards the Jews, made a lot of strong statements that they were permanently rejected by God, uh, made statements that eventually would be used against uh, Jewish people in the 30s and the 40s. Uh, with what was taking place during that time and with the Holocaust. So uh, punitive replacement theology, uh, probably in the last 20, 30 years, probably is not as dominant as it once was. I, I, I think the, this other form of replacement theology has become more dominant, which is what we call an economic replacement theology. And, and probably the, when you hear people talk about fulfillment theology, it probably would fall more underneath this category where with, with, a, with an economic replacement theology, it's not so much that God has permanently, just in anger, dismissed Israel from his plan, say, you failed me, I'm moving on to the church. It's more of the belief that God, in his sovereign purposes, have, has deemed that there would come a time where Israel as a nation would cease to have significance as a nation and a newer or truer Israel would take its place, and it would be, you know, a non-ethnic community, you know, made up of, you know, of Jews and Gentiles, and thus it would be primarily a spiritual community. That's a softer form of replacement theology because it's not emphasizing so much God's angry at Israel and permanently sets them aside. This is more of the, in God's timing, he planned for there to be a transition from a national entity, which is viewed as a shadow or a type, to a greater reality, which is a spiritual you know, entity as the church. So the definition that I have here is with economic replacement theology or supersessionism would be that God planned that with the coming of Christ, the people of God would shift from a national entity, Israel, to a non-ethnical um, group, uh, the church. Uh, around A.D. 160, Justin Martyr became the first person to explicitly identify the church as Israel. So, and that seems to be something that scholars on both sides of the issue seem to agree on, that as far as the first explicit statement, uh, it's coming place roughly in the mid, uh, mid-second century. My personal thoughts are, although you don't see, is, is it as explicitly stated in Romans, I think when Paul comes out and says, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew, and then he goes on to say, do not be arrogant against the branches, <laughs> 
I do think that even with the book of Romans that he is dealing with a growing replacement theology, even though it's not specifically called that. But as far as the first explicit reference to the church being identified as Israel, it takes place roughly you know, around A.D. 160. Uh, there are two historical reasons, some would even say three, as to the shift toward a replacement view. And many have noted that, you know, as the church, obviously as the church starts in Acts 2, it's predominantly Jewish. I mean, it starts in Jerusalem, you know, and when you get to Acts 15, there's the Jerusalem Council. The issue is not as is the church replaced Israel, but do we need to get the Gentiles to be part of Judaism? That's the, that's the issue in Acts 15, and the answer is no. You know, the Messiah is going to save Gentiles as Gentiles. They don't have to become part of Israel to be part of the people of God. And Amos 9, 11, and 12 affirms that because that passage is quoted. But as I note here, again, this is what many have, have, have noticed as well, as Gentile membership in the church increased and Jewish membership decreased, the increasingly Gentile church viewed itself as taking over the title and blessings of Israel. So it doesn't take very long before the church becomes increasingly Gentile. And when that happens, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way, and it shouldn't be that way, <clears throat> but there oftentimes has been a tendency in church history for, for Gentiles to view themselves and the New Testament church as not only taking over the identity of Israel, but taking over the, the role of Israel as well. Another reason would be the destructions of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 and 135 stimulated many Christians to conclude that God permanently rejected Israel. Um, there was a massive destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70, with many Jews killed, temple totally destroyed. That was something that Jesus predicted in Luke 19. Jesus predicted it in Luke 21. He predicted it in Matthew 23, uh, 37 and 38. I think it's also predicted in the Daniel 9, I think around verses 25 to 27. So actually, the destruction of Jerusalem is actually predicted in the Old Testament as well. Then there was another killing of a lot of Jews in that area in AD 135, when there was a, uh, an individual named Bar Kokhba claimed to be the Messiah, and the Jewish religious leader establishment threw themselves behind Bar Kokhba, and then the Romans totally wiped out the city uh, with, with a great amount of deaths there. They even took the Jewish high priest and literally skinned him to death. So they took the skin off of him. It was a horrible, horrible event. Um, so what ended up happening is a lot of uh, Christians looked at those two events, and they viewed it as a permanent rejection of Israel. Like I said, I think the right view is to understand that Jesus predicted that destruction was coming because they missed their day of visitation. We talked about that yesterday, Luke 19, 41 to 44. You could have had peace. Now you're getting your temple and your city destroyed. Why? Because you missed the day of visitation. Um, desolations are determined. Uh, she borrows uh, Daniel's terminology. So um, the result was, looking at the bottom statement here on this, as Lee Martin McDonald notes, quote, the church fathers concluded from God's evident rejection of the Jews demonstrated by the destruction of their temple and their displacement from Jerusalem that Christians themselves constituted the new Israel. So when you put together the growing uh, Gentile composition of the church, the destructions taking place in AD 70 and 135, I didn't include this on the notes, but there was also a growing um, tendency towards allegorical interpretation in the church in the uh, late second century into the third century. That's been well documented. That's not really disputed that there's, there's, a, there's a huge rise of allegorical interpretation. Uh, the, you know, theologians like Origen and others tried to blend a lot of Greek philosophy into Christianity, um, started to spiritualize a lot of the physical national things that were talked about in the Bible. So many would also feel that there was, again, a tendency to be much less literal with promises to Israel and anything concerning physical promises because there was a lot of uh, Greek philosophical thinking with some of the uh, theologians of the early church. Thus, several statements espousing a replacement view were found in the early church. I just give you a spattering here. This is more well documented in my book. Clement of Alexandria claimed that Israel denied the Lord and thus forfeited the place of the true Israel. Tertullian declared that Israel has been divorced. Cyprian, too, promoted a supersessionist approach when he wrote, I have endeavored to show that the Jews, according to what had been 
what had before been foretold had departed from God and had lost God's favor, which had been given them in past time and had been promised for them in the future, while the Christians had succeeded to their place, deserving well of the Lord by faith and coming out of all nations and from the whole world. Uh, I mentioned Martin Luther. Uh, in regard to the destruction of Jerusalem, you know, he made the statement, Listen, Jew, are you aware that Jerusalem and your sovereignty, together with your temple and priesthood, have been destroyed for over four, you know, 14, or 1,460 years? For such ruthless wrath of God is sufficient evidence that they assuredly have erred and gone astray, Therefore, this work of wrath is proof that the Jews, surely rejected by God, are no longer his people, and neither is he any longer their God. What does Paul say, though, in Romans 11, 1? Has God rejected his people whom he foreknew? Some translations say, God forbid. <laughs> Others say, absolutely not. I mean, that's you know, so what Luther's claiming here. Obviously, Luther does a lot of good things, too. We know that with the Reformation, but his later views on Israel were were not good and actually would be used throughout history by you know, for those who were opposed to uh, Israel. Okay, at this point here, I'm doing a little bit of a transition because, like I said, in, in talking about that, I, I wanted to start talking about some, some arguments um, that I think show that replacement theology or supersession is not a biblical view. Um, this wasn't an easy sort of uh, set of information to put into PowerPoint, so... I'm actually going to be going off of a Word document, but, I, but, but this part of the message I've actually put up on my website at uh, mikeblock.com. So if you, were, if you were to go there now or later, you, it would be one of the top links. I think you have to click on it and then click something else that's pretty clear. So this document that I'm showing you, you have, you have that if you want to uh, access it. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to shift over to... This would be a Word document. This isn't, this isn't a PowerPoint. And again, I think what I'll do here, and I know this may not be as easy to see, and again, that's part of the reason why I wanted to put it up on, uh, on, on a website too as well. So I, I guess what I'm saying is, is uh, if, even if you're not able to access it right now, if you go to mikeblock.com, you can, you can have all, this is the exact same thing I'm going off of. So even if you're not able to track um, all the points that are being made, you, you still can have it in print form. So uh, what I wanted to do here was talk about 12 reasons why I don't believe supersessionism or replacement the theology is, you know, is a biblical doctrine. And uh, like I said, I, I realized as I was looking at my notes that I wasn't going to be able to finish this all in one message tomorrow. So I'm, gonna, I'm starting it now, and then I'm going to continue it uh, in the morning. And, and so this won't be as rushed. So when you put together, I think these 12 arguments... I, I, they're at least persuasive to me that replacement theology is not a biblical doctrine. Um, the first argument is that the Old Testament explicitly teaches the restoration of the nation Israel. And so, now one thing about this point is there will actually be a lot of people who wouldn't agree with the restoration view of Israel or agree with what I'm saying who actually might, in a sense, agree that the Old Testament is teaching the idea of a restoration of Israel. Um, but for many of those people or theologians, they oftentimes think that when you get to the New Testament, there's, you know, God kind of hits a reset button and, and then the trajectory of the Bible storyline changes. A lot of the physical and national stuff becomes spiritualized. So um, not everybody would necessarily disagree with everything that I'm saying in these sections, but I, but I think it's important to understand that the, the Old Testament scriptures are very, very explicit that not only is Israel going to experience a salvation, but they're going to experience a restoration. It may be helpful at this point to, to, to tell you what I'm talking about when I talk about those terms. They're closely related, but when you hear me talk about Israel experiencing a salvation, that would indicate that they become rightly related to the Lord. They, you know, they, they repent. They, you know, whenever somebody uh, repents, believes in the gospel, and believes in Jesus, in his person and his work, they become saved. That happens to individuals all the time. Uh, the Bible speaks of a salvation of all Israel in Romans 11:26. 26. So um, there's a lot, there are people, there are some replacement theologians who won't even, who, who they, they don't even believe there's going to be a salvation of a lot of ethnic Jews in the end. They just say the church is the new Israel, or perhaps there's a dribbling of believing Jews throughout history that makes up the all Israel. So there are some people who don't even believe there's going to be a lot of Jews saved you know, in the end times. 
But you do have some who hold to a replacement or fulfillment view. Some of them may actually believe that there is going to be a salvation of a lot of ethnic Jews in the end. And I think that's good because I think that's true. But it's also important to understand the concept of restoration. Uh, I think restoration includes because Israel is saved, God is going to bless Israel and also bless the nation. So I'm not, it's not like they get excluded, but remember the covenants in the kingdom program run via Israel and through Israel's Messiah. But when we talk about the issue of restoration, that means that Israel is restored to their land. They're restored to the, not only the spiritual blessings of the Abrahamic covenant, but the physical blessings there's a lot of talk you know, in the prophets about Israel being restored to their land, and the crops are going to be great, and there's not going to be any uh, animals attacking people and killing people. And so there's a lot of, I guess, what we could call physical blessings that will take place at that time. Um, what I'm affirming here is I think the Bible is teaching both. I think it's teaching not only a salvation of Israel, but a restoration of Israel, because there is going to be a period where Christ rules the nations again from and over the earth. And as he rules the nations, you know, Israel is not better than the other nations. It's not like they're superior inherently, but God has chosen them for a role of service. Today, there are no nations. I mean, there's a sense in which the church is a nation, but there are no, uh, there are no nations right now that serve the Lord. But if you read Isaiah 19, verses 24 to 25, if you read Zechariah chapter 14, when the Messiah is ruling on the earth, he will actually be ruling over nations. So it's going to be a different dynamic. Um, those who believe in Christ are actually going to be the ones in charge. Uh, in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verses 26 to 27, Revelation chapter 3, verse 21, Jesus tells, the, tells us as members of the church that if we endure and we're faithful and we proclaim his truth and stay true, that, that he's going to give us authority to rule the nations when he rules the nations. Uh, I may mention that verse uh, later tonight or tomorrow, uh, particularly Revelation chapter 2, verses 26 uh, to 27. So what I'm, say, what I'm, what I'm affirming here is the, the Old Testament and the New Testament, but on this particular point, the Old Testament is explicitly teaching the restoration of the nation Israel. And there's one passage you should, you should be uh, familiar with in your study, um, and that is Deuteronomy chapter 30. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, uh, the reason why this passage is so important, and again, I want to qualify when I talk about important, I'm not saying it's more important than other passages or, you know, I believe all, all the Bible is equally inspired. But this is a passage that is very strategic because it, it lays out a big picture plan for Israel. And it encompasses a, a pretty long period of time because... Um, one of the things that's involved here, and I don't have time to read Deuteronomy 28 and 29, but you know, after you know, the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness for disobeying God, God's about to pick up the plan for the Israelites to go possess the promised land, uh, the land of Canaan. And in Deuteronomy 28 and 29, God says, if you obey me, you're going to get all these blessings. But if you disobey me, you're going to get curses. And if you keep disobeying, you're going to be dispersed you're going to be kicked out of the land, and you're going to be taken captive by other people groups and by other nations. And it's quite interesting because they're not even in the land yet, and God's telling them, he's telling them what's going to happen when they're in the land and then eventually get kicked out of the land, which I thought that'd be interesting to be there to hear that. You're not even in the land yet, and God says, okay, when you disobey me, and then I kick you out, and you're like, wait a minute, we just, we just got out of the, uh, Egypt, <laughs> and now we're being told that other nations are going to take us captive. But Deuteronomy chapter 30, you know, particularly the first 10 verses, is so strategic to understanding the Bible's storyline. I see this storyline of Deuteronomy 30 picked up in Leviticus 26, and I see it picked up in Ezekiel 36. It's, it's something that is carried um, through, through the Bible like a thread. But we're told in Deuteronomy chapter 30, So it shall be when all of these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you. Again, that's Deuteronomy 28 and 29. And then notice, and you call them to mind in all nations where the Lord your God has banished you. Isn't that interesting there? Again, like I said, they haven't even begun the conquest of the land yet, and God says there's going to be blessings and then cursings. 
And then when you call these to mind in all the nations where the Lord your God has banished you, he's, God's already predicting they're going to be dispersed to the nations. I mean, God's sovereign. God's, he knows everything. He's omniscient. He knows this is going to happen. And he, he tells them this is what's going to happen. And then he tells them in verse 2, And you return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and soul according to all that I command you today, you and your sons. Obviously, that, that's, you know, that's salvation, that returning to the Lord, that's repentance. So he talks about that they, they will, after dispersion, that they will return to the Lord. Then we're told in verse 3, Then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity. So again, that's more than just spiritual salvation. And by the way, when I say that, I'm not putting down spiritual salvation. Salvation is at the heart of the restoration. Um, so in a sense, we're affirming spiritual salvation is the most important thing because without it, there are no other blessings. There's nothing more important for a person or a nation to be rightly related with the Creator and with the God of the Bible. But he does say here, when that happens, verse 3, the Lord your God will restore you from captivity have compassion on you, and will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. So that's interesting there. Uh, And it seems to indicate here that this this eventual scattering is to multiple people groups. It's it's the peoples. I I think there's going to be a relationship to the Assyrian captivity in 722 BC with the northern tribes and the Babylonian captivity, 605, and... um, you know, 597 and 586 and those sorts of things. But, but this, is, uh, this seems to be even, hints at something even broader. But he says he's going to gather you again. So in other words, these, these people who have a promised land are going to be scattered, and then God's going to bring them back. And then in verse 4, we're told, if your outcasts are at the ends of the earth, so again, this indicates that this dispersion could be very widespread, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you back. So even if they're just scattered all over the globe, God is able to bring them back. Verse 5, the Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed. The land was part of the original Abrahamic covenant, going back to Genesis chapter 12. Land is important in the Bible. Don't let anybody fool you on that. A lot of times people are like, land, that's not important. You know, just what's important is spiritual blessings. Uh, spiritual blessings are important. Spiritual salvation is important. But God made uh, us as his image bearers to rule and subdue the earth and to live on land. And God wanted Adam to rule and subdue the earth. <laughs> he was to take care of the Garden of Eden. When God begins his program of, uh, of establishing Israel as a kingdom, they're going to have a promised land as a beachhead and a platform for what God wants to do throughout the whole world. When God eventually does, you know, when Israel's blessed, in their land someday, it's not going to be the case that it's just, Israel, it's just Israel has land and everybody else has to sit on a cloud in the sky. That's not the case. As God blesses Israel, the other nations will be blessed as well. So, but land is important. It's not a type. It's not a shadow. It's not something that has to be transcended. It's not something that has to be universalized or say, well, it doesn't really apply to Israel. It's just going to apply to everybody in a generic way at the end. My understanding of the land is God's plan with the land is for the land... Uh, Uh, to be a microcosm and a platform of as God blesses Israel, he uses that as a platform for blessing all the nations of the world. So in the end, everybody in the kingdom is going to be living on tangible land and ground and being blessed by that. It's not just Israel, but it's not at the exclusion of Israel either. But moving on in verse 5, he says, You shall possess it, and he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. So the blessings are going to be even greater than anything that they've had. Now, when you look at verse 6, I think this has salvation implications here. Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. Talks about here circumcision of the heart. Many theologians believe that's consistent with the New Testament concept of regeneration, where God moves in and causes somebody or you know someone or some group who are spiritually dead to be spiritually alive. He's going to circumcise their heart. Remember, uh, the problem with all people from birth is that their hearts aren't right. They have darkened hearts. The heart's the control center of the person. So when God deals with an individual, or in this case, a nation, he's going to circumcise their heart, which means that he is going to take the initiative to take a darkened heart 
and to make it alive. And I actually see this as really, I really see this as a prediction of the new covenant. We haven't talked about the new covenant yet. The new covenant comes in you know, Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. No pun intended, but the heart of the covenant is a new heart and God's spirit when you bring Ezekiel 36 into it. So this is the prediction that after dispersion that there's going to be a circumcision of the heart. I would totally tie that in with the new covenant of Jeremiah 31. And what's going to happen? They're going to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. That's one of the beauties of the new covenant is the Mosaic covenant is good and holy, but it doesn't enable people. It just basically shows the people their sinfulness. It doesn't enable. With the new covenant, God actually puts his spirit within people. He gives them a new heart, and they want to obey. And so that will take place. Um, verse 7, the Lord your God will inflict all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecuted you. And we also see in verse 9, the Lord your God will prosper you abundantly in all the work of your hand and the offspring of your body and the offspring of your cattle and the produce of your ground. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good, just as he rejoiced over your fathers. And so that's important to understand that, and, and not only in this passage, but in many passages, the, the Old Testament is promising that when God saves people, when he saves a nation, when he saves nations. He not only blesses them spiritually, makes them right with him, but there's also prosperity that is to come. I'm not talking about prosperity gospel in the sense of name it and claim it, but when Jesus comes again and he restores planet earth and he does the regeneration of Matthew 19, 28, or the restoration of all things of Acts 3, 21, that's going to impact the planet. It's going to impact animals. It's going to impact crops. It's going to, you know, be, if you want to read more on that, just read Romans 8, 18 to 25. And, and when you see when the curse is removed, how, how wonderful things are going to be. So it's really important when we're looking at the, at, the, uh, at the promises of Scripture that we don't make a dualism between spiritual promises and physical promises. Some people say the spiritual promises, those are fulfilled today, but the physical promises actually become spiritualized and so all this talk about land and Israel and those sorts of things, those are just shadowy, not so good things. And the Bible doesn't make that dichotomy. Um, I think it's true that in this age that we live in, that we do see blessings of the Abrahamic covenant and the new covenant. I think the emphasis in this age is on a new heart for a believer, indwelling spirit, and those things that we would call spiritual blessings. Or there's a literal fulfillment of spiritual blessings, but I think the... Uh, the physical blessings of the covenants are going to take place with the second coming. So uh, anyway, just remember, now Deuteronomy chapter 30 is, is a very strategic passage. Uh, another one is Exodus 36. Let me turn to Exodus 36. This is a lot like uh, Deuteronomy 30. In Exodus chapter 36... You should read all of it, uh, Exodus 36 and 37 as a whole, you know, just, just to, to see the context. Um, but we, we, we see here that, um, you know, God's talking about the fact that he's, you know, there's judgment coming to Israel, there's a scattering among the nations that is taking place. But in Ezekiel 36, 22, therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, this is Ezekiel 36, 22. It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. So it's interesting to think about that, that as God fulfills his promises with Israel, he's also you know, fulfilling what he wants to accomplish with the nations as well. And then if you look at verse 24, for I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land. So the land is significant. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I think that the sprinkling with clean water, I think that's connected with regeneration. I think that's connected with the circumcision of the heart of Deuteronomy chapter 30. So there's a, God is going to, to cleanse them. Verse 26, moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. 
So he gives, he gives them a new heart. And that's what Jeremiah 31 also promises. Verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. So here you actually have the specific promise of the indwelling Holy Spirit um, that's going to occur, um, that takes place with the new covenant. And by the way, I do think we see um, partial fulfillment of that even today, what's taking place with the people of God. I, th I think when people believe we experience the new covenant today, and, and the Bible tells us that we we get the indwelling spirit. We're also told, too, that when Israel believes, according to Romans 11, 26 and 27, that Israel, too, is going to be brought into the new covenant as well. So there's new covenant fulfillment now and in the future. Then in verse 28, you will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers, so you will be my people and I will be your God. Moreover, I will save you from all your uncleanness, and I will call for the grain and multiply it, and I will not bring a famine upon you. I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the produce of the field. So they have blessings there. Verse 33, on that day I cleanse you from all your iniquities. I will cause the cities to be inhabited, and the waste places will be rebuilt. So again, no, notice the intermix between salvation and blessings. Uh, it's not just one or the other. It, it, the salvation is in connection with uh, other blessings as well. Verse 34, the desolate land will be cultivated. I like verse 35. It says, they will say this desolate land has become like the Garden of Eden. So you're even taken back to Edenic conditions, and we're told that it's going to be like that. So you can read the rest of that chapter. If you were to read chapter 37, you get the dry bones prophecy, which basically is a visual demonstration of what was talked about in Ezekiel chapter 36. But it's very clear that there's going to be a salvation and a restoration of Israel. I also want to mention uh, Amos, or actually, I want to mention Isaiah 49. This is a real important passage to grasp. And, and one, of the, one of the reasons why this is so important is because it brings together actually four, four groups or four parties. You have God the Father, who's talking about his servant, who we know now is Jesus, and we see what this Jesus is going to do both for Israel and the Gentiles. So in Isaiah 49, 3, this is very important. It says, he said to me, and, and I, I think in a sense this me is who we would now know as Jesus. He said to me, you are my servant Israel. So it's interesting here. God is calling the Messiah Israel. The servant in the Isaiah passages sometimes refers just specifically to the people of Israel, but then there's times where the servant refers to a specific individual, like in Isaiah 52 and 53, where there's going to be a specific servant who's going to atone for the sins of his people. And we know that servant can't be just Israel as a people. Israel as a people can't atone for their own sins. But Jesus, the perfect Israelite and perfect man, can do that. But what's important here is that Jesus is linked with Israel. He said to me, you are my servant Israel. And I want to affirm very clearly that with the position that we're affirming here, you can identify Jesus as true Israel. That is a correct statement. As long as you don't look at national Israel as a false Israel or start coming to conclusions that because Jesus is Israel, there's no theological significance for the nation Israel. So the, so the key here is, Everybody's going to agree Jesus is the ultimate Israelite. He is the true Israel. Where there's going to be disagreement is what are the implications of that. There's going to be different answers. But anyway, if you look at this, it says, He said to me, You are my servant Israel, in whom I will show my glory. But I said, I have toiled in vain. I have spent my strength in nothing, for nothing in vanity. Yet surely the justice due to me is with the Lord, and my reward with my God. In verse 5, now this is where it gets really interesting. And now says the Lord who formed me from the womb to be his servant. Still talking about you know, what we would know as Jesus the Messiah. Notice what the servant does. To bring Jacob back to him so that Israel might be gathered to him. The purpose of the ultimate Israelite is not to make national Israel non-significant. The purpose of the ultimate Israel is to restore and save the nation Israel. So this isn't an either or, this is a both and. To use a fancy term, I like this is what theologians sometimes call corporate or federal representation, where the one, who's the strong one and the mighty one, in this case the sinless one as well, 
does something on behalf of the many. But as he does that, he doesn't make the many non-significant or disappear. It's kind of like uh, in, in Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus is referred to as the, as the ultimate man. He's, in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, he's the last Adam. He's the true man. But those of us who identify with him, you know, we're also part of mankind, but we find our restoration in him. So Jesus is the ultimate man, saves those who believe in him, and he imputes his righteousness to them. And so, you know, we don't disappear, we don't go away because Jesus is ultimate man, but he restores those who identify with him. So in this case, the servant brings Jacob back to him so that Israel might be gathered. And again, that gathering language, that's used in Deuteronomy 30, that's used in Ezekiel 36 in regard to Israel. Now, if you look in verse 6, we're told, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. So he again affirms the servant is going to restore Israel, ethnic, national Israel. But God says here, it's not just going to stop there. You know, that's just too small a thing for God. He's not just, and again, this affirms what we've talked, we talked about yesterday, that God, as he works through Israel, it's not just all about Israel. And I understand sometimes people who are teaching things like I do on the future, sometimes you can talk about Israel so much that you can get the impression it's all about Israel. As I mentioned yesterday, that's fallen off the other side of the log. Replacement theology has fallen off one side of the log. If you just act, that, act like God's just concerned with Israel, that's fallen off the other side of the log because Israel is a means and a vehicle for the blessings of the earth. So God says here, we're not just going to stop with restoring Israel. End of verse 6, I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. So this is a both and. The servant Israel is going to restore Israel and bring blessings to the Gentiles. He brings blessings to the nations. And as he's blessing the nations, he's not making them Israel. I mean, they're still the nations. If you read in you know, Isaiah 19, 24, 25, you see that Egypt's still Egypt. Assyria is still Assyria. Israel is still Israel. But this diversity, there's unity in the people of God and that they find salvation in Christ alone, and yet they still maintain their um, ethnicities, and that's part of the beauty of unity and diversity within the people of God. But if you move on, I mean, it says on in verse 8, Thus says the Lord, in a favorable time I have answered you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you, and I will keep you and give you for a covenant of the people. Notice, to restore the land, to make them inherit the desolate, herit uh, the desolate heritages. So it's interesting there, is even in the session that's talking, this section that's talking about Jesus, it, it, it in, indicates restoration to the land. So God the Father is tasking the servant Israel, the ultimate Israelite, Jesus Christ, to restore Israel, to bring blessings to the peoples and nations of the earth, and that also includes you know, the land promises as well. So all of those are there. And again, I just want to point that out because, again, there, some want to say because Jesus is Israel, there's no significance for the nation Israel, but that, that's not what the scripture teaches, and that's not what this, what this passage teaches. Okay. All righty. So anyway, I guess what we'll do is we'll just summarize this first point. And it's a really good thing I didn't try to do this whole message in one, because I'm only one twelfth done. But um, I promise that the other points go a lot faster. So, but anyway, I'm glad I did this. I'm glad I didn't try to do this all, all in one shot. But anyway, what I want to do is I, I want to reaffirm this first point that the Old Testament explicitly teaches the restoration of the nation Israel. Um, I'm going to show you the other points tomorrow, and I'm going to show you that when we get to the New Testament, that storyline continues literally. It's not like we get to the New Testament and get a reset button, and then everything's just totally radically different or spiritualized. The New Testament's going to affirm uh, the Old Testament expectation. So hopefully you can come back for the... Uh, again, in the morning we're doing a... Uh, uh, there's three messages tomorrow. There's the, uh, the early, I don't know if you call it Sunday school, Sunday school message. Then there's the sermon on Romans 11. And then we're going to do kind of talk about some, some things that I may not have gotten to yet. I want to address on Sunday night and then perhaps some, have some question and answer. So anyway, let's close in prayer. Father, um, we just thank you for the chance to go through your word. And again, I just pray that you would help us to see accurately um, 
Lord, we just ask not just, just what is true in the Bible, but why it's true and how these things connect together. You're a God of order. You're a God of design. You don't do things randomly. Um, may we be able to see um, what you're teaching us you know, through your word to be able to connect the dots so that we may understand who we are in you accurately and what your purposes are. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let us stand.